everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is a continued conversation exploring food systems and procurement strategies as a driver of health equity. My name is Katie Michael, and I'm a legal fellow at Change Lab Solutions. For those of you just joining us, this panel is part of the Building Healthy, Equitable Communities series, a new project from Change Lab Solutions. The series is a virtual space to explore the elements of a just community and the conditions that will help all children and families thrive. Over the next six months, we'll be releasing six collaborative episodes that that offer training and discussion on how policy plus community power can advance health equity. You can see the full schedule here on the screen and on our series homepage. Our kickoff episode explored health equity as a principle and a practice and set a high-level theoretical framework for how to use law and policy to advance health equity. We just wrapped up our second episode which explored policies that support working families. Both of these episodes are now available to view on our website, and the link is here on the screen at the top of the page. Today we're here for Episode 3, Building Healthy, Equitable Communities Through a Just Food System. So just to recap, um, each episode in this series, including this one, contains three components. The first component is a blog post which shares the consequences of laws and policies that don't take health equity into account and how we can respond. In Episode 3, we examine the challenges of developing and implementing effective food policies, highlighting eight existing policies that fall along a spectrum of harmful to helpful impact. The second component is a webinar that provides both on-the-ground stories and innovations from community health leaders as well as resources to support people's work in healthy change making. Last week's web webinar explored how institutional purchasing can contribute to a more just food system and promote health and equity, and it featured Brett Jones of Cleveland's Evergreen Cooperatives. Finally, each episode closes with an expert panel, and that's what we're here for today. Um, Today's amazing panel features diverse expertise in food policy and procurement strategies from program design to policy advocacy to on-the-ground implementation. So before introductions, let's quickly touch on format. Uh, we sourced most of the questions for today's conversation from you all through the blog, webinar, and expert panel registration page. We've aggregated the questions and will now pose them to our panel. That being said, if you have questions that come up during the panel, feel free to enter them in the chat box on your screen, and we'll do our best to get to them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers to introduce themselves in their organizations, and then we'll move into the conversation. So let's start with Colleen, uh, and then Kate, and then Katie. Uh, so passing this off to you first, Colleen. Thanks, Katie. Hi, I'm Colleen McKinney. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Good Food Purchasing. We're based out of Berkeley, California. Uh, we operate a program called the Good Food Purchasing Program, which started in Los Angeles at the LA Food Policy Council in 2012, and then spun off into a national initiative housed within our organization, the Center for Good Food Purchasing, in 2015. Um, our work is highly partnership-based, and we work with national organizations like Food Chain Workers Alliance, Heal Food Alliance, and Real Food Media, as well as community-based organizations in cities across the country to expand this program, and the reach, and impact. So in the last three years, we've grown from five agencies in the city of Los Angeles to where we currently are, which is working with 27 institutions in 14 cities that have jurisdiction over about $880 million in food procurement spend, and institutions that we work with commit to working toward meeting goals along uh, five, the five values in our program, local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare, and nutrition. Great. Thank you, Colleen. Um, Kate? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Siebold. I work for Minneapolis Public Schools as our district's Farm to School Coordinator. Uh, Minneapolis Public Schools is the third largest public school district in the state of Minnesota, serving and educating right around 36,000 students. 
Uh, I work within our culinary and wellness services department where we oversee food service for our district as well as nutrition education, food system education, active living programming, and wellness policy. Uh, our district in 2013 began a process of really redefining the meaning of school food in our district. Um, and so we're in the process of installing uh, fully operational kitchens back into all of our 72 schools. We also provide scratch cooking, minimally processed meals to our students made with fresh local products whenever possible. In my role, I oversee our work in partnership with 13 small to mid-size growers to store sustainably grown produce for our school meals. Um, one big thing we're working on right now is we actually just underwent our baseline assessment uh, for the Good Food Purchasing Program, and we're entering into our implementation phase for that work. Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Um, Katie? Hi, everyone. I am Katie Bishop Kendrick, one of the State and Community Advocacy Managers with Voices for Healthy Kids. Um, and Voices for Healthy Kids is a joint initiative between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the American Heart Association where we're focused on state and local advocacy campaigns to help all children grow up at, um, to be healthy. And our procurement policy work specifically focuses on a variety of different settings. So we work on policies around school foods, um, food and beverages and early care and education, and then also the area that I work most closely in, which is getting um, state and local governments to adopt policies to improve their own food procurement. Um, and one of the things that I'm most excited about in our work is we're actually having um, some discussions and we'll be holding um, a roundtable where we're really going to be digging into health equity in the um, space of food service and correctional facilities. So really excited about that um, coming up soon. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for those introductions. Um, and just as a last reminder to our audience, um, now that you can put a face to a name and have a sense of the wealth of expertise on the panel today, just want to remind you again that if questions arise during our conversation, um, just pop them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn to our first question. Um, Health equity is an overarching theme for our entire series, and we've been exploring how health equity applies as a lens to different subject matter areas. So for that reason, I wanted to kick things off by asking our panelists to briefly share what equitable procurement means exactly and how procurement relates to health equity. Um, so Colleen, why don't you start us off, and then we'll go to Katie and then Kate. Sorry. So for us, um, I think equitable, equitable procurement really prioritizes people, animals, and environment rather than just the bottom line. And so it means access to institutional supply chains for small and low-income producers and producers of color. It means um, workers along the supply chain are compensated fairly for their labor and, and have a voice on the job and, um, and work in safe environments. And it means um, you know, in the words of one food service administrator that we work with, living up to the belief that access to good food for all is a right, not a privilege. Um, and so I think um, recognizing also that, um, you know, the environmental impacts um, have, you know, disproportionate impacts um, for various communities that are, you know, served through institutions as well, and, and institutions can use um, their purchasing power to to have an Im impact across all of these values collectively, um, and that they all they all link to health um, at the base of it, at the foundation. Um, Great, this is Katie. Uh, Katie. Yeah. So at Voices for Healthy Kids, um, we're very focused on embedding health equity into each of our different policy areas, um, and so that. With that, we try to include strategies for equitable implementation in all of our policies because we know that in the past, um, some of our well-meaning public health policies might actually have further exacerbated health inequities. Um, so for example, looking at um, some um, physical education policies that were passed for schools, um, what we found is that by passing sort of standard policies to increase the minute requirements in schools, going back and looking at implementation, we found that some of the schools in wealthier areas 
you know, were able to adopt those policies, and so they improved their physical education. Um, but then some of the policies in lower income areas actually weren't able to meet those standards, so it actually um, increased those health inequities. So with some of our food procurement policies, um, what we've tried to do is really take a look at targeted universalism and making sure that the folks that are going to have you know, maybe some of the hardest time in meeting those policies um, get the tools that they need to be able to put the policies in place. Um, so for some of our policies around improving the foods and early care and education, um, we actually try to go after appropriations dollars to be able to have training and technical assistance to make sure that providers in, that are serving um, kids in low-income communities have the tools they need to be able to implement those policies. Um, and as I mentioned before, with the Health Equity Roundtable that we're um, going to be having very soon to talk about food and corrections, that's really a place where we're going to be um, determining the strategies that we want to include in that policy area to make sure that it's being um, implemented equitably. Great. And Kate? Yeah, I think um, just to build off what Colleen and Katie already um, talked about, for, for our district, equitable procurement means sourcing food and products from a diverse group of vendors that's representative of our community and our school district to ensure that all of our students have access to quality food that um, allows them to learn and thrive in school. Um, so our district does this by actively seeking opportunities to work with small to mid-sized farmers, uh, minority and women-owned businesses, new businesses in our area, and other vendors that share our values. Um, and by doing this, we're able to serve our students a high-quality meal, regardless of their family's um, social position or other circumstances. Um, and by doing it, we also are able to support the health of our community and the people who are um, growing food in it and, and sourcing food for our, for our families. Wonderful. Um, any other thoughts about that until I, uh, before I move on to the next question? So I think that that was a great uh, big picture framing of equitable procurement and how procurement can be used as a platform to address multiple values and aspects of our food system. And so moving from that big picture place into more specifics, um, I was hoping that the panel could describe the first steps for people who want to make changes to an institution's purchasing practices. And um, Kate, why don't you take this one first, and then we'll go on to Katie. Sounds great. Um, I would say that the, the first step, if you're looking at um, what changes you can implement in an institution in your area, would be to sit down with that institution and, and learn about what their procurement methods and processes are like. Um, we just recently did this as our district with our um, region's coalition that's promoting um, the Good Food Purchasing Program. And all of our coalition members found it really helpful as a starting point just to understand um, the rules and regulations that we as a, as a public school district have to follow. You know, they were curious about what percent of our budget do we spend on food? Um, what is the process for identifying our vendors? What factors do we have to consider when um, bringing on new vendors? And what challenges or barriers we face as we look to implement these changes? And from there, it um, really gives you an understanding of how best to meet that institution where they're at and, and think about next steps together. And it makes that institution feel heard and recognized um, for the work that they're doing. Once you do that, I think you can start thinking about what the possibilities are for change, um, what maybe is your best starting point, what's an approachable goal for everyone involved. But really getting an understanding first about what, what procurement looks like um, is important because uh, you'll find that with different institutions, their, their processes and rules and regulations might vary based on state or the different um, institutions that they have to report to. Great. Uh, thank you. Katie, did you have additional things to add to that? <clears throat> yeah, so I would add, um, so I think 
um, just sort of building off of that, um, when you're starting out, going to look to see what policies or contracts might already be in place um, with different vendors. And you can look at those um, policies and contracts to see if there are any provisions already included that are um, related to the different areas you're trying to change. So do they already have um, some components around nutrition in there, or do they already have something about um, preference for minority and women-owned businesses? You can sort of see what the starting place is. Um, and then you know, when you're going in to talk with um, the procurement folks at that entity, you can be um, already knowledgeable about um, you know, what might already be in place. Um, and then really building off of what Kate just said um, is that you know, finding out who is in charge of procurement at that, you know, that state locality or the entity you're trying to work with um, so you know who is going to be overseeing the process so that that can be that person you're reaching out to to find out um, you know, what the process is, what their current priorities are, um, and all of those things. And then I would also recommend um, through Voices for Healthy Kids, we do have a toolkit of resources um, around healthy food procurement. And we have some really great things in there like a messaging guide. Um, we have a frequently asked questions document that we put together with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Um, and we have a document around tips for working with vendors. And I think some of those resources can be really great to read ahead of time um, before you're going into some of these conversations because they might answer a lot of introductory questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts to add? This is Colleen, and I would just add that um, I think with our program in the five value framework that we, um, that we encourage the institutions that we work with to, to take on. Um, sometimes institutions might be a little intimidated by thinking about taking on all five values at one time and committing to all five of those values. Um, and so one of the ways that we often, that we start with the baseline assessment is just sometimes to use that as a way to get a barometer and, you know, really helping them think about where they are to start rather than, like, knowing that they're not going to necessarily be able to, you know, achieve goals in all five of the values at once, but knowing where they are can help them set um, sort of a, a achievable and incremental strategies and a feasible time frame to get um, to get to, to meeting goals in all five of those values over, you know, a, a one year or five years or whatever it is. So um, just thinking about, I, I would just, yeah, echo, like figuring out what the, where they are and what the opportunities are and understanding that um, with them to be able to help encourage um, growth that's in line with the community values on the five values of the program. Okay, great. Um, so turning to our next question, uh, we had a number of people ask about what procurement looks like at various types of institutions. Um, so I was hoping the panel could describe the, the various settings where procurement policies have been or could be adopted and describe whether there are any differences in advocating for and implementing the policies in those various settings. Um, so Colleen, why don't you take this one first, and then we'll go to Katie. Yeah, so I would say that our primary experience has been with, within cities and school districts. Um, and so I would say the major difference um, between working with agencies like school districts and then working with um, city agencies is, is one, that school districts have a lot of purchasing power. Um, and and are really, you know, strong anchor institutions in their communities and can wield pretty significant influence through their choices and through their contracts. Um, and they often also have, you know, dedicated staff like somebody like Kate that is thinking about food procurement as part of their daily job. Um, and then in our experience working with city agencies, they, they often don't necessarily have that, um, the, somebody with that expertise in, um, in food procurement on the ground um, within the individual departments um, that are purchasing food. So they'll work with a food service management company or a nonprofit agency um, to provide food services, and, and the person within, embedded within the city department is actually more of a contract manager. Um, so if they aren't bought in or see it as a priority, um, then it's going to take additional work to convince contractors that it's a priority as well. Um, and so I think that 
um, for a lot of these reasons, you know, cities can play a really important leadership role, but, um, but some place like a school district um, may actually be a good place to start in terms of actual food, um, having an actual impact on the food system and changing the food system um, and, you know, really figuring out where to start in terms of being able to meet some of those goals. Thanks. Um, and then, uh, Katie, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I would add, so we do a lot of our work um, on state and local government property, and there are just so many different types of food service that are happening on government property or that the government is funding. So things from, you know, public universities to agency buildings where, you know, government employees are working to the Parks and Rec Department or correctional or juvenile justice facilities. And each of those settings is feeding, you know, very different populations and they're going to have very different concerns. And so I think you'll also have very different rationale for why you're trying to put a procurement policy in place for those settings. Um, so in places like um, agency buildings where it's a lot of employees, the focus might really be around workplace wellness and ensuring that those employees have access to healthier foods while they're at work. Um, or if you're looking at early care and education facilities, um, it could be around, you know, making sure that those kids are getting off to a healthy start in life. Or with places like juvenile justice facilities where the youth are under the care of the state, um, you know, if the state isn't providing healthy foods for those youth, then they have no ability to eat a diet um, that's in line with the dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, so, you know, going with each of those settings where they might have a different rationale for why you would be putting a procurement policy in place, they're also going to have very different um, concerns and priorities for those different settings. So thinking of juvenile justice, you know, safety might be the number one concern of the people overseeing those programs. Or with a public hospital, it might be about um, wanting to be able to provide comfort to their patients. Um, or, you know, there are going to be other agencies that are really just focused on um, the budget and cutting costs and those types of things. So I think in looking at all of these different settings, it'll be really important to assess, you know, both what the rationale might be for working in those spaces, but also what some of those other priorities are going to be, because it's really going to help you determine um, what level of interest or willingness people might have to work with you to try to improve um, the foods available in those settings. Thanks. Um, any other thoughts on this question before we move on? Okay, um, so shifting gears a little, um, I want to focus on how law and policy can support equitable procurement. Um, I think when we think about procurement, we often think about little p policy, meaning policy adopted by an in individual institution. Uh, but in some cases, big P policy also has a role to play. So Katie, I was hoping you could address how state and local legislation has been used as a tool to encourage or mandate uh, changes in pur purchasing practices by government agencies or other institutions. Yeah, um, so there have been a variety of different policies passed at both the state and local level that have addressed everything from um, you know, just looking at the foods that are sold through vending machines on public property, um, all the way up through, you know, a really comprehensive policy like New York City passed, which is actually through an executive order, um, not through legislation. But they, um, they passed a policy that really covers a broad range of different food service. So it covers everything from what's sold through the vending machines to what's being served at government meetings or sold in employee cafeterias, all the way through correctional facilities. Um, and the state of Washington also has a procurement policy that was put in place through executive order um, that's looking at a broad range of the food available on government property, both for um, the nutritional content of the foods, but also they have a provision in there around um, having a certain amount of local products um, being purchased. And I think also with um, you know, these policies, you can be including um, provisions in there around um, having preference for minority and women-owned businesses in different government contracts. 
So I think um, the policy mechanism is a really great way to put these different standards in place and to really have um, long-term sustainability since there is that um, accountability um, because it is put in place by, um, by the legislature or by the executive of that state or locality. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have additional examples to add from your work? Okay. Um, so building on this idea as policy as a tool to ensure long-term change in institutional purchasing, uh, we had a number of questions come in about uh, best strategies for messaging to stakeholders, including institutional leadership, staff, and existing suppliers about the benefits of healthy and equitable procurement in order to get, on board, get everyone on board to make policy change. So um, Kate, why don't you start, it off, start us off and then we'll go to Colleen. Yeah, I think um, messaging is, is definitely an important thing to consider as you're starting this work. Um, and I guess, you know, the first thing I'll say is I think it's important to emphasize that there isn't one specific way to go about implementing healthy and equitable procurement practices um, at, you know, for the institution that you're working with. Um, and that it can look different depending on what the needs are of the different stakeholders that you're working with. Um, and so, you know, as you're thinking about implementation, working with that district and leadership and staff to figure out um, what the best, best path is for them is um, a nice way for it to feel um, not too intimidating. I think um, the more people that you can just bring together around the table to really talk about what these procurement changes could look like um, and, and how to make them sustainable, um, the more likely you're going to find success. Um, it's that opportunity to have everyone there, you know, thinking about how to work together that um, great approachable ideas will come out. Um, in regards to specifically, you know, talking with institutions, I think thinking about these procurement changes um, is an exciting opportunity for the institutions to think about new product options that they can explore, um, increasing their customer satisfaction, um, and, and the promotion and name recognition that they can get around it. Um, but then also for the other community partners and community members that you have around the table, it's an opportunity for them to make their voice feel heard and um, work with the institution to um, implement the changes that they're looking for in the community. Um, and I know that at least with our coalition and work that um, I've been involved in, there's certainly always the discussion of cost and, and what that will look like for the institution. And um, what I'll say to that is, you know, cost is always certainly a factor when working with institutions, but there are ways to be creative about um, how to implement changes in a way that is financially responsible and sustainable for those districts, whether it's, you know, focusing on just specific items as they're getting started or, you know, maybe one, one area of the five categories of the Good Food Purchasing Program or maybe it's just starting by working with a few other institutions to do some cooperative buying. Um, there's different, you know, uh, phases that you can implement to make those um, cost factors not quite so daunting. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, did you have anything to add? I mean, Kate covered uh, really well a lot of what I had hoped to hit on. I guess I would just say in terms of um, the question about cost, I think, you know, one of the things we like to think about is just ways initial strategies that can be that can have an impact that that might not cost more, you know, recognizing that there are, you know, certain types of products that will cost more and so that there it's going to have to be creative um, to be able to think about, you know, the whole menu as opposed and the whole plate as opposed to individual items for example, um, and you know, be able to be um, you know, there substitution might be able to be made to be able to look uh, by products that cost a little bit. Uh, 
Um, so I just wanted to point out a report that Friends of the Earth did that looked at carbon and water footprint savings of a less meat, better meat approach um, in one school district. And, and they found that as that school district actually saved a little bit of money on a per meal basis um, and then and sort of quantified the impact in terms of um, the carbon and water footprint savings. And um, one example is that the, sa the carbon savings were the same as installing 87 solar panels on roofs in that district, um, so which is something with a significant upfront investment. And they, this district actually was able to, to save some money um, in the process of, of that strategy. So just you know, thinking about what are some strategies um, as opposed to like one-for-one -one substitutions of, product, of individual product items is one strategy um, to think about that. Um, so that's just one thing. And I think you know, in terms of the valued workforce category, um, there, you know, the baseline for that in our program is, um, is that suppliers are in compliance with domestic labor laws. And so there's a lot of work um, to be done in this category that doesn't necessarily cost more to take, you know, to take steps with suppliers to start a conversation about what, what's um, happening and how it can be, how changes could be made to help um, you know, create safer and healthier and fairer workplaces for, um, for employees along the um, institution supply chain. So um, you know, there's, there's ways to, to make progress and to take steps that are really meaningful and powerful um, without, you know, without initially spending more money up front. And this is Katie. I would just add um, a couple of resources that we have on our toolkit site that might be helpful for people, particularly as they're thinking about that cost question. Um, so I, Kate and Colleen both just provided a lot of really great um, tips, but a couple of additional things going back to that frequently asked questions document um, that I mentioned we created with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Um, it does have a section talking about cost and it links to a resource around managing costs for food service. Um, and then also our document about tips for vendors um, you know, gets to sort of the, some of the business arguments of why you should be putting some of these policies in place. Um, and just one other resource that I would mention um, which gets to messaging around health equity but not specifically about um, sort of the audiences that were mentioned in this question, but I think another important audience um, when thinking about you know, the big P policy is we have a health equity messaging guide, specifically if you're trying to talk about embedding health equity um, into legislation. Um, so really with the audience directed at um, policymakers, but happy to share that with folks if that's something that could be helpful for them. Okay, thank you all. Um, this next question is somewhat related to the last one, um, and it's specifically about how partnerships both within and outside of an anchor institution can be leveraged um, to help to adopt and implement procurement policies. And so specifically, who are the key thinker, who are the key partners that should be brought to the table and that people should think about in this process? Um, so Colleen, do you want to start us off with this one? Sure. So I'm, this is just based on our experience um, working on our program, but I think what we've sort of identified is that there are, um, you know, really three key partnerships that, um, that when they're in place, um, lead to the most successful adoption and implementation of the Good Food Purchasing Program. And so, one, the first of those is a diverse representative coalition that um, that you know represents the community, um, all of the issues, the issue areas of the program, um, and you know a range of um, partners across sectors that can push for policy adoption um, and then continue to you know identify ways that the policy. Uh, framework and the, the values and the transparency that are adopted um, can can be used to you know, help meet ongoing procurement goals and, and really ensure that the procurement, um, is re the, the procurement process is reflective of community values and that the community you know, has a voice in, um, in responding to you know, the direction that an institution takes. Um, so that's the first. The second 
is a political champion, like an elected official um, that can really offer support to departmental staff um, to, you know, to encourage them to keep going in the direction that they're going and doing good work, um, or to help push individuals um, that might be that might be putting up roadblocks to success, you know, if there's um, various departments that are involved and the food service department is all in, but a procurement um, department is, um, you know, somewhat reluctant or, um, you know, not necessarily bought into um, good food as a, you know, component of solicitations, you know, that an elected official can, elected champion can really help um, be, you know, to push in the right direction. And then the last, I think, is the is having, you know, visionary supportive administrative staff who are, in, you know, the ones actually charged with decision making, meal delivery, um, you know, tracking and reporting. Um, so having somebody, you know, embedded um, within the department who's really who really gets it and is um, excited about making a procurement policy. Um, work and have that, you know, the health equity impact um, and the, you know, just the social impact um, that it's intended to um, is the last key component that we've really seen um, to, to be really critical um, in the success of the work that we're doing. Um, and then I think, you know, just in terms of uh, other key partners that have played a big role in um, this city of Austin, you know, the, like I talked about, it's a, a, the city purchases relatively little food, but the city sustainability office has uh, really wanted to take a, a leadership role in thinking about how they can still, um, you know, have an impact on procurement. So they've played a convening role to bring all the major food buying institutions in the area to the table um, and so that they can talk collectively about how to leverage their collective, collective purchasing power um, to really impact um, the local economy. So one of the things that they've talked about is, you know, what does it look like to to support local companies who are, you know, doing the right thing to help um, to help make sure that they're, you know, able to access supply chains or that they have, you know, that that they're um, getting certifications that they might need to have a competitive advantage um, in bidding or things like that. So um, just really thinking about the convening role that um, that institutional partners can play um, with, in places where, you know, not as much food is being purchased directly. Thanks. Um, Kate, did you have uh, additional thoughts to add from your experience at Minnesota Public Schools? Yeah, I think Colleen did a great job of kind of outlining a lot of those um, partners and stakeholders that you want to have around the table, and I think um, in our area, we've found similar success by having those different groups. Um, so here in Minneapolis, um, you know, our city sustainability office has been involved. Um, our community's food policy council has played an active role um, along with other partner organizations that are involved in um, local food and, and public health work. Um, <clears throat> we've had people from unions involved as well. and um, We've had some food producers and farmers at the table, which I think is important. Um, and what we've found, you know, sitting at the table with all these folks is, um, as, as our district, you know, was going through the, the baseline assessment process, um, these different partners were really able to help us think about this work in the context of um, just other efforts that are happening in our community um, and the political climate and, and thinking about strategies for how we continue to promote this work um, at a city level. Um, but they were also um, able to offer us, you know, specific support on different areas. So, um, you know, for instance, we were able to work with one of the union reps to learn more about one of the um, chicken processing plants that we work with. And so um, these these partners, when you bring them to the table, they're really able to um, help that anchor institution in, in a lot of different ways. And so I think um, as different areas are starting this work, the more people that you can bring to the table and keep at the table, um, the better, because they're going to be um, really valuable for that anchor institution to feel supported and um, 
and, and guided. And all of the different um, stakeholders at the table, too, will, will learn something from one another um, so that we can you know, prevent work that's happening in silos otherwise. Wonderful. Um, any other thoughts on this question about partnerships? Okay. Um, so next, uh, I was hoping to briefly look at sort of the nuts and bolts of what a strong proc procurement policy should include, and really just how procurement policies work. Um, so Katie. Can Take this one first, and then we'll go to Colleen. Sure. Um, so to start with, um, since you know the American Heart Association and Voices for Healthy Kids are focused on um, nutrition standards for the meals and snacks that are being served in these settings, um, I would start by just recommending using one of the national sets of um, nutrition standards that are already available. Um, so through um, voices, we encourage using the American Heart Association Food and Beverage Toolkit, um, the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, Healthy Vending Guidelines, um, Food Service Guidelines for Federal Facilities, or, you know, like Smart Snacks or National School Lunch Program. Because um, there are just already a lot of tools that have been created around those standards that can help vendors be able to put um, the standards in place. And then also it can be pushing industry to reformulate towards specific guidelines. Because um, when, you know, industry is looking at all of these different guidelines that have, you know, different milligrams of sodium or different levels of saturated fat, they don't have a clear target that they're working towards. Um, but like we've seen with um, the Smart Snack standards, you know, a lot of progress, um, products have been created that specifically meet those guidelines. Um, and by having other types of locations, so having workplaces or state or local governments using those same sets of standards can help to get those products out to more um, locations. Um, and of course, you know, those are focused around um, standards for the meals and snacks as an end product, but I know, um, you know Colleen and others would be focused more on the purchasing standards, so can probably speak more to those. Um, but just a couple of other things that I would suggest um, including in a good procurement policy would be things around um, like implementation and compliance to ensure that the policy doesn't just get passed, but it also gets well implemented. So things like um, you know, a, a specific team listed that's going to be in charge of implementation or um, some provisions in there around how monitoring is going to happen to make sure that um, the vendors are compliant with these policies. Um, also, things can be added into um, the contracts with vendors. So things about you know, what will happen if there's a breach of the contract and the vendors aren't meeting the standards that you've laid out, or having fines for um, the vendors if they're not meeting all of the different requirements of those contracts. Um, and a couple of other things. One that's really um, would be great to have in more policies is around reporting and evaluation. Um, so from what I've seen, a lot of these policies that um, just focus on the nutrition side don't have a lot of um, reporting and evaluation, but having some components in the policy up front to help gather that information so you can do good evaluations um, will be really important for being able to show the health impact, the revenue impact, all of those types of things. Um, and then also provisions around, um, you know, again, um, having a preference with contracts for minority or female-owned businesses are great things to include in policies. Um, so those are just a few things. Yeah, and I would add, this is Colleen, I would add um, that I just to, to reiterate the components around um, implementation and what is reporting and compliance um, going to look like and how are you going to ensure that, um, that vendors are, you know, that they're you know committing to you know goals and actually following through um, on you know what they're what they're committing to um, is a really huge important I think you know in, in addition to the values of our program we see transparency um, that's just a huge um, 
a huge value of what we you know hope to help build um, through the work that we're doing. That having having folks from across all of the values um, can help really you know tap into specific areas that political champions are interested in or are particularly passionate about themselves, whether it's fair labor or animal welfare or health equity. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it helps to build a uh, broader coalition of political champions on a school board or a city council or um, whatever it is as well um, to have, uh, you know, a diversity of community groups at the table. Um, and then, yeah, okay, no, I think that's it. That's everything I wanted to say. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Um, so just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, I wanted to address, um, we had one question come up. Uh, after a procurement policy has been adopted, obviously an institution will have to go through a contract or negotiation process to work with suppliers that they already have or to find new suppliers entirely to meet the standards that the institution has put in place. Um, so I wanted to ask what are some good strategies for managing relationships with existing vendors when an institution is undertaking these changes? Uh, and also how can an institution use the contract bidding and negotiation process to encourage large food, ma food management companies uh, to make changes in their supply chain? Um, so Kate, do you want to start us off with this? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> in regards to the, the first part of the question, thinking about strategies for managing your relationships with vendors, um, I guess I would suggest um, just be open with your vendors as, as much as you can um, and upfront with them. Um, <clears throat> we uh, often meet with our vendors just uh, you know, to talk through different things we're working on. And so I think the more upfront and open you can be with them about um, the changes that are taking place, maybe the policies you've adopted, the better. Um, because if they're, if they're good vendors, they'll want to um, adapt to meet your needs, um, and that may just, in some cases, take a little time and planning. Um, and I think it's helpful for institutions to explain why the changes are happening and, and provide a little bit of context so they can um, <clears throat> figure out how to best fit into, into future plans. Um, but yeah, I think, I think my biggest suggestion would just be, you know, communicate with them, keep them in the loop. Um, the, the sooner you can tell them, the better, rather than just kind of springing it on them um, last minute. Um, but, you know, thinking about then the, the bidding con or the contract bidding and negotiation process, um, what I'll say is, you know, uh, contracts and bidding documents are, an institution's opportunity to really lay out their needs. And so the more information that an institution can put in that bidding document about their expectations and desires from their future vendor, um, the better. If, if a vendor wants your business or feel like it's a good fit, um, then any changes that they need to make are worth it. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the, the larger amount of business that you can offer to a vendor, maybe the more enticed they'll feel to accommodate changes, um, which I know can sometimes be a challenge for really small institutions. Um, but I think really thinking about how you talk with your vendors about how these changes can really benefit both, the better. We have found that with some vendors, um, you know, asking them to do something different has been a little more acceptable for them if we're able to say, you know, we, we happen to also know that these other institutions may be looking for this product or, um, you know, well, we can buy it cooperatively with other institutions. Um, think about ways to, to bring them to the table to feel open about it. I think that will help a lot. Um, but again, just be open. Be very specific about what you're looking for. Um, the more specific you can be in that bidding document, the better, because then as you're going through um, picking your vendor, you know exactly what you'll be getting or at least what they should be following, and then you have that to fall back on if any issues are to arise. Um, so my advice would be 
um, for institutions that are implementing these changes, um, be, you know, spend time working on that bidding document to really make those changes and those updates. Um, it's, it's really worth it. For our district, um, with our farm to school program, our produce, our primary produce vendor is required to um, buy produce from our identified farm to school partner farms. And um, the way that we've made that work is by being upfront about that in the bidding document and really providing as much information as possible of what that looks like in terms of the farms we work with, what our expectations are for how they'll handle that produce, and what we're looking for them to do with it. Um, and that way they're able to read that document and come back to us with any questions they have. And both parties are able to enter into a contract really knowing what is expected from one another. And I think that's the best way to um, make it successful. Great. So a question just came in uh, from our attendees. Uh, the question is, do you have any boiler documents that can be shared, including like RFPs or any other contract development and negotiations documents? Yes, absolutely. Um, so Minneapolis Public Schools, we do have a Farm to School Toolkit on our website that has um, the Our Farm to School RFP that um, our farmers um, fill out when we're identifying our, our small partner farms. But we also are able to share other language that's put in our, like our general produce vendor um, contract and other um, institutions. We don't have necessarily all of those on our website, but um, I encourage anyone to reach out to me if they want to see the language that we've incorporated into our contracts. They're, they're public documents, and so we're happy to share them, but um, also help, you, you know, help to explain anything that we've put in there if you're curious as you're reading them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we only have about five minutes left, so I wanted to start wrapping up even though we didn't get to all of our planned questions. Um, and first, I just want to express my sincere thanks to Colleen, Katie, and Kate uh, for taking the time to participate today and for sharing uh, their knowledge and helpful insights. Um, in our first expert panel in this series, Mary Lee, the Deputy Director of PolicyLink, highlighted equitable procurement as one of the most exciting spaces to work in right now to try and move the needle on health equity. And I think that today's panel has really built on that and shown that to be true and has also provided a lot of really helpful information about the nuts and bolts of uh, making changes in institutional purchasing practices um, in terms of meeting institutions where they're at when you're getting started um, and making sure that institutions get what they need, um, especially under resource institutions in terms of funding and technical assistance to uh, move forward with procurement policies. Um, and I think we also heard a lot about, about uh, what a big tent procurement really is in terms of bringing a lot of different players in the food system together um, from big institutional purchasers to uh, smaller farms and businesses um, and big food management companies and then of course people who are um, being served the food within institutions. Um, and I think just the key theme that rose to the top for me um, is that institutional procurement is both a tool to ensure that people within institutions in all kinds of settings, including uh, child, care child care centers and um, correctional facilities, have access to healthier foods. And then uh, procurement can also be used to address some of the upstream social determinants of health for people outside of the institution, um, including access to good jobs with fair wages, um, access to uh, the supply chain for minority and women-owned businesses, um, and less toxic and more environmentally sustainable food and farm practices so that workers are protected and communities continue to have clean air and safe drinking water. So with that, um, 
We're excited to announce that Episode 4 of our Building Healthy, Equitable Communities series will be launching in August. And that episode is going to explore comprehensive city planning as a driver of health equity. I also wanted to highlight some of our resources if you'd like to take a deeper dive into equitable procurement. Um, the resources listed here on this slide are all available on our website, and they will also be available on the episode archive page after this webinar is over. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we received several questions from our attendees that we did not have a chance to get to today um, about food policy generally, and just want to note that in addition to those procurement resources, um, there are many other resources on our website that may provide answers to some of your questions. Um, and if you don't see what you're looking for, please reach out to us for technical assistance we may be able to provide some help. Um, and then finally, I'd like to encourage all of you to keep this conversation going. Um, feel free to contact any of us with questions or comments. And as soon as this panel ends, you'll be directed to a follow-up survey. Um, so please take just a few minutes to share your feedback with us on this episode or the series as a whole. And uh, the recording for this panel will be available soon. Uh, you'll receive a follow-up email notifying you when it is up. And finally, just thank you so much to everyone for joining us, and please tune in to future episodes. <laughs>